And we're actually going to look at some demos and some examples of, of deep learning as well. And we're going to have plenty of these sessions uh, talking about these kind of things. Um, shortly, I'll also talk about some of the upcoming events um, where we're going to have a data science AI hackathon. And IBM South Africa is going to be one of the sponsors. So we're looking at June to do that. So it's quite exciting. And we also have our first uh, MIA meetup next week in Gauteng. That's going to be in Santon. It's sponsored by Equinox Events, well, it's Barclays, APSA, in the APSA building. Um, very nice, super fantastic venue, by the way. Um, so Barclays is obviously also a sponsor. Um, the future events will be between CT here uh, or Barclays Rise. So we will go back to Barclays Rise as well. They've got a, you know, big screen, nice setup there uh, on the fifth floor. So there will be future events there as well. Um, okay, so let's fire away. Yeah, so just sponsors, Cortex Logic is one of the sponsors, um, and then obviously City um, Cape Innovation Technology Initiative. So this is the agenda that was announced. Um, I don't know who has the opportunity to, to do the homework. I don't know if you saw the email about the homework. Um, and it's, it's basically it was a, a, a LinkedIn article just about deep learning and its applications and talking about not only that, but also limitations and talking about quantum machine learning. We've got people in the MIA community that's actually researching quantum machine learning as well. So we'll have future events. We'll be talking about that. Um, okay, so just in terms of uh, who read the data science deep learning article, I know it was, hey, good, good stuff. I know well, you, you commented on it even, so. But anyway, I would recommend if you're interested in um, just the lay of the land, in terms of what's the platforms, uh, what are some of the applications, I'm going to talk about it here. I'm actually going to go through some of the so-called inspirational things that people do uh, talk about, what is those deep learning applications, and, um, and there's quite a bit of stuff that's happening in real science as well. Uh, SKA is using it, Stone 3 Mining is, well, it's engineering, they're using it for all sorts of things. Um, I would really encourage people to, to really strongly look at that. I think it's a very important tool in the machine learning toolbox. Um, clearly, um, Google and Microsoft and uh, Baidu and Amazon, everybody's really putting their weight behind this because they realize this is very disruptive and it's driving AI forward significantly. So it's a, it's a very important thing to become accustomed to and, and, and start using. So I've got quite a bit of links and stuff that I will send afterwards as well, um, and things that you can do, some more homework, but, but things for you to do to actually, just to, there's nothing like trying it, working, working through the examples yourselves, and there are plenty brilliant examples, and I'll, I'll share some of the things, there's even one, I think it's on the Google machine learning, or on TensorFlow, where they say, um, deep learning without a PhD, so, and, and it's, it's a fantastic slide deck, even my son that's, no, great, nice, and seven. Well, he's, he's going with, with this through. Well, he understands some of the concepts and everything. So it's, it's not that complicated if you spend time with that. Anyway, so today's agenda, um, uh, we're going to try and be, um, well, <laughs> we already didn't start at 6 o'clock, so we start at 6.15. So um, what I want to do quickly in agenda is a uh, quick introduction. I've already started with some announcements already. Um, so I think we can pretty quickly dive into deep learning um, and its applications. And then um, I actually, we're going to have a whole session just on demonstration of deep learning examples um, using Google TensorFlow. So I've got some examples, some examples using Keras. We can be interactive and talk about it. I know there's some users, so you guys can participate as well. But then um, the second part is talking about IBM Watson and, and also talking about AI conversational systems. Now we've got Rikus Kombrink here. Rikus, where are you? There we go. So Rikus um, was in Las Vegas and uh, he was to, I don't know, who also, also attended this IBM Interconnect conference. Okay, so, so people want to hear, Rikus, what you have to say. And uh, in, in Cortex Logic and Benedict AI, we are actually working with IBM Watson 
many of their services. Um, they will be present in Sandton as well, and as I mentioned, they're going to sponsor hackathons as well. So, um, so we, we can have a little discussion on that if there's enough time. And then Rick is going to end off with a, a, a brief demonstration of, we say state-of-the-art AI conversational system, and when you look at it, it's very impressive. It's better than Siri or anything like that, but it follows a symbolic approach, which in my mind could be brittle as well, but we can debate, we can talk about that, but it's still very impressive um, what it does. So looking forward to that, Rick, uh, um, to, to go through that. Um, uh, just on that point, um, in, the, in the businesses that I'm involved in, uh, Benedict AI has been mentioned by Gardner as one of the cool smart manufacturing um, uh, cool vendors in smart manufacturing 2017. We're just a startup in, in that. Um, but we are actually building intelligent virtual assistants for manufacturing users. So people like soft supervisors or operators of equipment and, and so forth to actually increase the productivity. So that's another example. With Quarter Clutch, we're also building that, but in other industries like financial services and telecom we, and all sorts of other areas as well. But, but you will see plenty of startups and people interested. They realize this is the next wave when we want, they want to participate. I've got some slides talking about some of the, the hot applications, so we'll refer back to that as well. So I think it's very topical. So let's uh, dive into it. Um, I, I'm actually going to start. OK, so this is just talking about, okay, maybe just very quickly. It, 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 me as, well, the whole community is growing, so this is, this is a fantastic opportunity for people to engage with others as well. So if you join Slack, for instance, then there is already 900 plus registrations across the MIA channels. So obviously that's not unique because people are on, say, LinkedIn as well as on Meetup or something, but it's, it's close to 700, almost unique. So, so there's a lot of people that you can engage with, and this community is for us. So, um, uh, so you're welcome to utilize it. And, and um, we encourage people, if you, you've got something interesting to present, just send it to info at machineintelligenceafrica.org and uh, we, we put it on the list of, 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 of things as well. And if you've got ideas in terms of activities, please, please uh, propose that. Let's do it. We're also signing up more and more ecosystem partners, um, so you can see a list of uh, ecosystem partners there. We've been even working with Nigeria, Data Science Nigeria as well. Um, but yeah, so this list is growing and it's growing stronger and we, we still want to do some of those. You'll see when you go to the MIA website, there's a bunch of stuff on projects, research projects, application projects, and, and also projects around solving problems in Africa. Um, and you're welcome to look at that. Um, and we're looking for sponsors for some of those projects. And uh, so that's, that's all part of the plan. So I think this is just the beginning. Okay, so I'm not going to go through this. This is just a slide that shows all the, the latest events, and I've covered that. Maybe just want to mention there's going to be a, in Cape Town on the 25th of May, um, how can AI disrupt industries? It's going to be a panel discussion, and Mia, I'll be there as well, so Mia will be represented. Um, the other one is the AI Data Science Hackathon. I think we're looking at 10th of, uh, of June. And then the other event is obviously the Santon event that I've got listed there. OK, so I'm going to skip all of this now. So let's um, go straight to deep learning. I've got a separate presentation on deep learning. Um, but maybe I'll just start with this, and then I'll dive into the other presentation. I mean, before I do that, I'm actually going to start with this. Then I'm going to just jump into some high-level applications. So you can just get a sense, and then we can dive into, OK, what is the details? And I can describe some of the techniques. I've got a slide summarizing some of the individual types of deep learning. And I've got a slide deck that also talks about deep learning architectures. It's this incredible field that's exploding. Um, so much research, so much money being pumped into this. Um, so if you look at this slide, this slide is also in the LinkedIn uh, post. Um, so uh, what is artificial intelligence? It's really a branch of computer science um, that develops machines and software with intelligence. Well, that's the simplest definition. The machine learning is a branch of, of AI, 
or artificial intelligence or machine intelligence and it concerns itself with the construction and study of systems that can learn from data. And then what is deep learning, today's focal, well, focal discussion, it's, it's really a set of algorithms in machine learning and when we go through the, the, the dif different architectures you will see it's quite a variety of things. So, but in principle what you do see here is an attempt to model high level abstractions. And that's what you get with vision, it's exactly what's happening in the brain. I've got a nice example of the brain and we're going to see exactly how the visual pathway, how it corresponds to say convolutional neural nets um, on a high level, very simplistic, but, but you can still see uh, what's happening. So we know that the human brain works like that. Um, but but it's, it models high level abstractions in data by using model architectures um, composed of multiple nonlinear transformations. So it's multiple nonlinear transformations, but it's also the way it's being um, combined. Um, I don't know who heard about gen uh, generative adversarial neural nets. Okay. Oh, there's some people there at the back. Um, so th those are examples. Of, it's actually together. It's an unsupervised learning system. You don't even give it labels, but they're actually competing with one another. One generates the image, the, and then the other one discriminates between real versus not real. Is this real or not? And and it's kind of used as the as the target or the or, or kind of the um, producing uh, try, trying to drive the generative neural network to, to actually to optimal performance, to generate as close as possible to reality. Um, but anyway, so we, we will we can talk about those kind of things. So let's, um, yeah, so this is just uh, why deep learning is suddenly changing your life. Okay, the slide is here is similar to the previous one, just giving the definitions. Um, but there's a very interesting post um, just talking about these kind of things. And I'm going to uh, share a few slides that talks about um, some of these applications that that talks to that. Um, so maybe just on a high level, if, if you think about deep learning, you've got um, a bunch of training data. Say, for instance, you want to recognize a wolf or a dog. So in this case, you can see the end results there. Well, it's recognized a dog, 90% probability or certainty, but, and then a wolf, 10%. But basically, what's happening with a lot of these deep learning techniques is that you, you provide it with an uh, input and then the first layer is just looking at um, it's, the, the neurons there is just responding to different uh, uh, and simple shapes like edges or corners or all sorts of stuff and then with the next layer is it's actually just starting to combine these um, features into higher level complex structures and start recognizing that and it continues like that until it builds up the whole image and in the brain it works like that. I've got some other slides that shows this but this is very simplistic but this is in essence uh, what's happening. Um, so I'll skip that, skip that, I'll skip all of this. Okay so uh, uh, of, if you look at uh, Google, Google is using this almost in all their applications and search and advertising, speech recognition, photos. And when I say this, this is they're using TensorFlow, so they're effectively using all oh, this is a platform for deep learning. So they're using this, they're using it in maps, street views, translate, YouTube, um, and for visual object recognition, vector representation of words. Um, all of that. Some of the examples that I've got today is, is really the stock standard ones, just to keep it simple, and it's around MNIST, which is really the classification of handwritten uh, digits. And the, the deep learning te technology techniques become really good at, at solving this. Um, uh, other types of examples is um, a CAT, object recognition there, and then this yeah, so that's just simple object recognition, but also you see recurrent neural networks being used for uh, machine translation, where you just you provide it in English, the quick brown fox jump over, and then it responds in French or a different language um, straight away. And I've got some examples, we're going to talk more through this, but just the image captioning. So here they're using actually a combination of convolutional neural networks that does the image recognition. Um, and then it actually is it's connected to a recurrent neural network that generates a sequence of words and so it picks up all the different um, objects that it recognizes and then constructs a, a sentence based on that. So it's again combining uh, networks, neural networks. 
It's a man holding a tennis racket on a, on a tennis court, uh, two pizzas sitting on top of a stove, top oven, a group of young people playing a game of frisbee, and then a man flying through the air while, uh, while riding a snowboard. So that's creative, but, but it, it's, it's really, if you think about it, you can almost see it. It could be, maybe, okay, it's not a man, but it's, 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 it's trying to figure out something there. Okay, so this is very small for the guys at the back, but this just um, in general, uh, uh, in the LinkedIn article, and we'll share the presentations with everyone afterwards as well, um, there's some general use cases around um, sound, time series, text, image, and video. Where there's lots of data like that, but then you can see all the industries where this is applicable. So you can even apply to floor detection, finance credit cards, um, floor detection, engine noise, and automotive innovation. If you think about sound. But uh, there's, there's a bunch of very interesting applications of time series. You know, you've got recurrent neural networks, so you, and you've got LSDMs and gated, all these kind of very powerful neural networks that can remember way back um, and can understand, uh, remember the context. And you've got in those networks, you've got neurons that can that has got forget gates, input gates, uh, output gates, and all sorts of stuff. So you can control what you remember, how much you remember. All of those type of things. So it's, it's really getting sophisticated. So in, in finance, um, it's quite interesting. They even talk about experts are applying deep learning and blockchain to move stored data securely. I haven't seen that yet. Will the people actually do that? But this is what they say. Um, but robo advisors and virtual banking assistants. So you can create, there's different ways of creating these virtual assistants, and we're going to talk about it. So today, Rick is going to talk about more a symbolic approach to that. If you look at IBM Watson, it actually uses a combination of machine learning where you learn the intents, but it, 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 you actually still you, you build the dialogues as well. So you, you create a little bit of structure there. But to take that to the next level, there needs to be proper semantic understanding um, of, of, of the... And this deep learning is being applied on that, uh, on that level as well. So it's getting re really, really interesting. Um, and obviously you can apply it in financial forecasting, stock market prediction, data mining, other areas. Okay, uh, this is interesting. Um, when companies were asked about, or financial services firms were asked about deep learning applic AI application of banking, if you look at the next five years, these are some of the reasons that they've given. Um, and they were saying personalized communications at scale improve our ability to complete with our peers, but the ones that was actually at the top there is um, increase our standing as an innovative company, identify opportunities in data that would be otherwise missed, that's true, if you look at structured, unstructured data and stuff. The, uh, people at the back, if you, you're welcome to come to the front, because it's very difficult to see, but uh, okay, cool. And then the final one, to increase workforce productivity, and I think a lot of that is, is about, even Benedict AI is about how to increase, how, to, how can we shape this technology to help us to be more productive as well, so that we can do some higher level things as well. So there's obviously the risk around job, can you lose potential jobs and stuff like that, but I think we can evolve as we've evolved with computers. There was no computers not a few decades ago, so and we've evolved and learned to work with this. So I think we will see something of that as well. Um, okay, so before I get to the deep learning specific slides, this is the, the stuff that I wanted to, to show. So. Um, this, there was an article recently also on deep learning application and banking to look out for in the next five years. And the first one was anti-money laundering. It refers to Obviously that refers to unlawful well, set of procedures, laws of, or regulations designed to stop practices generating income through illegal actions. But there's, there's really a focus on stopping that, preventing that with AI, deep learning. Chatbots, we know that. Uh, for me, chatbots are just a start. That, you, that it can evolve into truly intelligent virtual assistants, and then from there to really advisors and providing instructions and helping you, maybe more fully integrated um, with the systems, with the data systems, but also not only that, also um, connected to um, a knowledge corpus. So it provide, if you ask it about very specific things, it should come up with that, um, with the answer straight away. Um, Algorithmic trading, that's a... Uh, who's in trading? Anyone in trading? 
Okay, great. So uh, we are looking at applying a lot of signal processing and AI as well um, in corporate logic trading. So we, we are already left space as well. So, um, but it's a, a very interesting, exciting field. Fraud detection is a huge one, and then customer recommendations, uh, recommend recommenders and stuff is always in retail everywhere, effectively. Um, and, and this was interesting. Um, this was done, okay, what did Andrew Engie say? Um, Andrew Engie, well, he used to be the chief data scientist of Baidu. He was a Stanford professor, started, yeah, and all of that, but he's now, he left uh, Baidu. Um, he said, just as electricity 100 years ago transformed industry after industry after industry, I think AI powered by deep learning will now do the same. And he's got more conservative kind of approach as well to this. Um, he's obviously passionate about this, but he doesn't, for instance, believe in necessarily super intelligence like Elon Musk and Ray Kurzweil and those kind of guys. He's more kind of guys into this stuff that sees that we, how we can shape it. Obviously, it's a danger as well. We've got to be super careful. I'm more in that camp as well. I think we can shape it. We've got to be super careful. It's powerful technology. Um, it's exponential technology. Um, but this is interesting. Um, on the left here, it was just showing artificial intelligence revenue, top 10 use cases, world markets 2025. So this is where they think things go. And at the top here was algorithmic trading strategies performance improvement. Um, and then just above that was static image recognition, classification and tagging, um, efficient scalable processing of patient data. You will see huge applications in healthcare. I don't know who's in healthcare. Anyone in healthcare? That's interesting. Um, that's another area of big interest. And then predictive maintenance. If you look at GE and Siemens and anyone in industrial internet or industrial companies, uh, predictive maintenance is a huge part of it. Um, my, my previous company, Season Systems, I, was, I sold it to General Electric. And, and, and basically, the software is being utilized not only for process performance optimization and uh, troubleshooting and stuff, but also for equipment, troubleshooting, preventative maintenance, and what GE, for instance, is doing is providing services around, if you can move all those sensors, say for instance, an airplane, turbine, well, you've got the engine, you've got, say, 2,000 sensors, that's in real time, you, you know exactly what's going on, you know the status, and you can decide exactly when I need to maintain that, and how long this would work, and what, exactly what's going on. You've got. What are, the, what are the causes for any deviations? You can get that in real time, um, and you can plan better. So there's huge use cases around that. Okay, um, and just to end off some of these applications, um, they all, some of them all are discussed in that LinkedIn post as well, but this is interesting. So Google acquired a few years ago DeepMind, DeepMind's in England, um, and DeepMind was doing quite a bit of research, but they do have a commercial arm now. And um, obviously they've helped to optimize using reinforcement learning, deep reinforcement learning, also uh, Google's data centers, and save something like 30% in, in energy um, um, as well. So, so that, that, that's, that's an awesome result, application. But the interesting thing is um, they are really targeting healthcare as well, especially in the UK, and working with the National Health Society or organizations, and in a, NHS, and on services, National Health Services. So yeah, Google did mind to scan a million eyes to fight blindness. So this is great to see these kind of positive applications um, of, of, of deep learning. Um, I'm not going to... If there was time, I can go through this, but this, this is an agricultural interesting application where um, neural nets with deep uh, Gaussian processes are used for crop yield prediction, so in the US, and specifically on a uh, county level soybean production in the US, and it's actually getting absolute state-of-the-art performance, better than some of the other techniques as well. So another interesting application. Um, so, as you know, IBM Watson is being heavily used in, in healthcare. Um, so, um, and, and basically, here is an example where it recommends the same treatment as doctors in 99% of cancer cases. So you can start trusting this, and, and it's sometimes better. I know in Japan there was an example where they couldn't uh, detect it properly, and they used Watson, and they, and they actually picked up the problem uh, fairly quickly. Um, 
and, it, it, and some of the stuff relates to genomics and all sorts of things. So there's so much data available. Um, it's actually it's interesting if you think about when talking to customers and companies, um, the data utilization. Uh, sorry, first of all, just yeah. So data is being generated at an incredible pace, and obviously with IoT, you're generating a lot more data. But if you think about conversational systems, we've got a new stream of data now. We've got what people are conversing and talking, um, that data stream is also being captured. By the way, that's what we're doing with some of these virtual assistants as well. We capture that, so you can do all sorts of analysis on that um, as well. Um, but it's really, generation of data is going almost exponentially and utilization is going up, but it's not following that trend, so the gap is increasing. So there's huge opportunities uh, to, to do things. Fortunately, the techniques are there, data, the data is obviously there, the, the computational power is there, so it's fantastic opportunities for, for anyone that data science, AI, machine learning to make a difference in utilizing this properly. Okay, so I'm not going to go into this, this is showing actually very specific medicine examples, um, let's skip that. Um, Five ways deep learning improves your daily life. This is just article, one perspective, and uh, not everybody is using Netflix and Help and Yahoo and Stitch Fix and Google, so, uh, machine translation, but this is just examples of where deep learning is actually being utilized. Um, so I've got some examples here, do very quickly. So um, this is just Netflix dynamically personalizes layouts and movie thumbnails. So if you think about A-B testing, there's a lot of loss that typically happens if you have to wait. You can actually do things in real time and uh, they are actually utilizing these kind of techniques to, to personalize things and, and make it the whole user experience just much better and more effective at targeting a you know, personal, personalized level. Um, Yelp um, surfaces the most beautiful photos for any venue. Um, so. Uh, and actually what's interesting here, so the, the, the top one is actually the old version, and this is the high quality version below. Um, and basically what they did was to train neural nets, deep learning neural networks using DSLR, which is digital single lens reflect cameras images, as positive examples and non-DSLR as negative examples. The deep learning algorithms learned the qualities of good photos from the training data set and could apply these learnings to all photos where they're taken with DSLR or not. So that's just an example, creative way of just training it. So obviously there's some supervised training happening. You've got labels that you so use the metadata in the files, and then you train it, and then, then it knows, okay, this is, a, this is actually a good photo. So, and and, it, and, and then, then you can actually just apply it, which is, which is really interesting. So um, this is where Yahoo ensures you pick the best emoji for any situation. <laughs> So, um, would you like to go on an adventure with me this weekend? Um, and all those kind of comes up with relevant stuff. And um, they're actually using a combination of stuff: fast text, a fast linear classifier, LSTM, a type of recurrent neural network architecture, and Word C um, CNN, which is a convolutional neural network. So, obviously, applied to words, convolutional neural network approach that, that balances performance and complexity. Uh, but anyway, so this is just examples of that. And even in fashion, uh, but, but here it, it was not, it was actually just the visualization, so they're just starting, and they were using TSNE, and also K-means clustering methods to actually um, position and visualize data so you can actually make more sense of that and, 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 and uh, uh, get a better result. And then the machine translation is obviously getting better and better and better. Um, in September 2016, Google announced that they were uh, replacing their older methods for machine translation with neural network architectures. And they were previously using phrase-based machine translation. And now they've moved to recurrent neural networks, deep recurrent neural networks. I'll, I'll, in the next slide, I'm going to quickly talk about that. Um, and you can see the performances uh, at the bottom here, the human performance, and this is actually translation models. So it's showing uh, translation quality and it's showing translation models and it's showing English to Spanish, English to French, English to Chinese, etc. from Spanish to English. Um, and it's quite interesting, you can see with French to English, you're getting very close. 
Um, this is the blue is the phrase base, and then the GMT is the green one, is where it just takes it to the next level and very close to human performance on machine translation. So it's so it's it's really um, getting better. And then I'm going to end with this these examples. Um, I've got actually automatic. Yeah, I've actually tested out quite a bit of these stuff. Um, the, this is actually quite cool. So you can take a black and white photo and colorize it using deep learning. Um, and, and you can generate pictures, you can do all sorts of stuff. And actually, this is a, a photo, photo view that I colored in. It didn't get, I think, the eyes right, but the rest of it is, is, was, was, was pretty good. Um, this is an interesting one. I actually want to see if I can show this. Um, this is an example of automatically adding sounds to silent movies. Um, and I'm going to quickly click here to see if it comes up. Uh, I don't know if it's actually... I I'm just going to show it 30 seconds, but it, 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 it's, it's really cool. So here it is. translation so it looks at this dark chocolate XL cookies and actually does the translation um, straight away like that um, and then some of the things that we've talked about before so this is just looking at normal image net classification using deep convolutional neural networks um, and just this is how it just picks it up hat with a white brim dog etc. And then automatic handwritten um, generation. Um, and, and what's quite interesting, I've got quite a, a number of examples of where you can actually use it to generate text and using recurrent neural networks. And if you train it, say, on Shakespeare, it starts, it's initially very poor, but it actually starts writing Shakespeare. Um, um, and, and, and it can generate that. And so it's, it's uh, not everything makes sense, but, but it's 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 quite interesting to see that, um, and even if you um, Python, who knows Python? Who works in Python? Hopefully, it's a lot because Python is critical, yeah, uh, in data science. Um, but there's an example here as well where it actually you, it, it's been trained to uh, generate Python scripts as well. So it looks at the sequence, it starts learning the structures, the keywords. And, and it's quite interesting, even some of the comments and stuff, the generates comments and stuff like that as well, which is amazing. Um, 
Okay, so you see, we've, we've talked about these examples. There's more examples of automatic image caption generation, and as I've mentioned before, it's convolutional neural nets, and I will quickly talk about it, and recurrent neural nets. Um, and I've got actually an example of, um, this is some of the things that uh, DeepMind did initially with Atari games, um, where you get, super, you get superhuman performance um, in, in Breakout, for instance, where you really detects the strategy very quickly of, of how to actually um, uh, do this properly and digging a tunnel and then working to the back and all of that and all it received was, was really pixels and there's obviously a teacher and teacher is just a score so it's reward and penalty based on that and just reinforcement deep reinforcement learning is using that so it's slightly different to supervise where supervise you actually give it the actual output with, with, with Q learning or, um, or reinforcement learning you're actually giving it um, uh, just, just a signal. You know, right? you, you've got a, objective, a, object, a, a function that you optimize, and it, in this case, is the score um, that you optimize. I've got an example of Flappy Bird that I'm going to show you the just a clip now of where I've trained it on my system here. I had to train it overnight, and it was starting to get it right. It was trying to to to, to start moving in between. I'm going to actually play it now. Yeah, well, this is the this is a picture, so that's my screen the other day, and this is Flappy Bird and DQ Learning playing Flappy Bird. And it's amazing how initially, and I've looked at this, I believe it was bumping into this all over the place, it was struggling, and then it, you can see this uh, giving rewards, or it penalizes and it gets a Q max score, so obviously trying to optimize that score. Um, well, I'll play the clip now. Okay, then to the end of this application part, so I started with that, was just. Um, I don't know who knows two minute papers on YouTube. I would, I would recommend you, you look at two minute papers. It's normally not two minutes, it's normally three minutes or four, but because I talk about other things as well, but it's, it's pretty good because they, they go through, this is some of the examples. And some of it is more scientific as well. Neural networks learns the physics of fluids and smoke. Deep learning program hallucinate videos. Photo geolocation, building a system to determine the location where a photo was taken using just its pixels. Um, and, and there's some other interesting sentence completion, um, some, uh, some really interesting um, applications. And some other ones as well, where recurrent neural networks is used to generate music. And it could, could generate music in the theme of, say, Bach, or, 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 or you, you train it obviously on that, but it comes up with all sorts of new things to so say it generalizes uh, and it's amazing to see that so you can use current neural nets for that uh, well, there was a various orchestration of beard movements out of joy it's worthwhile just uh, clicking on that and, and recurrent neural network writes music and Shakespeare novels they say using a recurrent neural network for password cracking <laughs> um, and but anyway plenty of uh, other interesting examples um, scientific ones as well and this is the one I want to recommend. I'll, I'll quickly open it up in the, in, the, in, the, in the demo session, but anyone that wants to learn more about uh, deep learning, Google has got this in their cloud big data machine learning blog. Learn TensorFlow and deep learning without a PhD, and it's two excellent presentations. Really excellent. It really, it's, you can just go through it. They've got video clips in, inside to show the training. And it's done exceedingly well. So if you want to, so I, I would highly recommend it. So this, these are the two. Um, so I've got it open, so I'll quickly show it just afterwards at this time. Nvidia talked about some of the deep learning top five things. Um, okay, I'm going to skip that because we talked about that. Um, I'm just going to skip some of these now. Yeah, well, I think this is true. Our machine learning will evolve data science um, and science in general. So. Yeah, there's examples of in education where uh, uh, UC Berkeley is creating artificial intelligence graders. So it's really trying to um, uh, basically interpret your results and give feedback and grade your your um, your answers. Okay, so I'm going to stop that. So in in the article, I also mentioned some of the, the top deep learning platforms, and clearly TensorFlow is. Uh, is is going past cafe now um, and here you can see some of the, the graphs so but between 
TensorFlow and Cafe, well, that, those are, you can see TensorFlow is the green one. So obviously it's been released here, and it's just going strongly. So that previous one is, this is just some, if you look at all the research papers going to NIPS and all these neural network conferences, uh, almost 10% of them, the papers use the TensorFlow framework, um, and that's growing all the time. Okay, so I'm going to skip some of this. Um, even this, I, I'm uh, maybe, maybe just a very quick comment there. Um, the first, they talk about the first, second, and third wave. This is a slide from DARPA, you know, Defense uh, uh, Organization, US. Um, so, the, and, and the next level, if you think about AI, you want it obviously to be good in terms, not, not only in perceiving or learning, but also in abstract, abstracting and reasoning. And to actually do that well, you need to add a contextual model. Um, and so, so we'll see the third wave of AI will be looking at how do we create semantic, proper understanding, how do we bring in contextual awareness. I don't know who's read the book, uh, Pedro Domingo's book on the master algorithm. I don't know if you've, somebody, okay, so that's another book that's interesting because it talks about the five tribes in AI. And, it, and the one is um, the symbolists, so the guys that's doing the expert system, the rules, and so forth. The next one is the connectionist. This is the, the neural network inspired by the brain, um, all the deep learning stuff that's there. Um, and then, then they talk about the Bayesian, they talk about um, the group, they talk about the analogists, uh, the, the guys that look at analogies, and they're using supervised uh, support vector machines was, was categorized there as, as one of the, the master arguments for that. Um, and yeah, probabilistic, I talked about the Bayesian stuff as well. So it's, it's, it's interesting because it gives you a nice perspective of what's currently available. Okay, okay, we're going to skip this. Um, skip, skip, skip. So I'll share this demo examples. Maybe just the end of this video. This is just how I, I was training my reinforcement learning network. And it's so if you, if you hit it, obviously it skip the penalty. It's too quick to see it there, but you can get rewards and penalties, so it's still struggling. This was after a day, so it was still not getting it right. So obviously you want to train this in lots of GPUs, but now it's getting it right. It's just amazing. Well, you, you don't teach it anything. Well, there's no programming. It's just based on deep reinforcement learning. And uh, okay. So, okay, that's that. Um, Rick is taking, <laughs> we need to get to you as well. So what I will do, I'm gonna, um, I, I'm just gonna, I want to show you, I'm gonna show you just a few things here. I'm probably gonna skip a few slides, but, uh, so I'll share these slides afterwards, the links to this as well. Um, but this is just talking about Google's um, interest in, um, oh sorry, uh, if you look at Google Trends or you look at Google Ngrams, just the interest over time, deep learning, and obviously things just moved up um, um, since, well actually 2005 things really kicked in to, to gear, but, um, but you can see machine learning and deep learning as a ser seriously interest there. And there were some interesting comments. It will be talk, it's, this is some of the, the leaders, in the research leaders in the field, who talk about hype and reality. And this is again Andrew Engie, was just Eng, was saying, I have worked all my life in machine learning, and I've never seen one algorithm knock out benchmarks like deep learning. Um, and Jeff Hinton was the guy, one of the key guys behind um, the, uh, uh, deep learning, uh, restricted Boltzmann machines and, and deep learning. And especially students was just awesome, um, but obviously guided by him. And and basically, he was saying deep learning is an algorithm which has no the theoretical limitations of what it can learn. The more that you give it, and the more computational time you provide, the better it is. Um, so I'll skip a few here. So even at AI takes off at Google, so you can see the number of software projects within Google that uses the key AI technology: 2,700, 2015. <laughs> and putting their weight behind this. Um, this is um, at NIPS. You can see the the, the, blue, the, the purple there is, is just the um, deep learning contribution. So it's just 
click into gear completely. Let's, so I'm going to skip some of the things here. So this is just some of the uh, machine learning basics. Um, and, it's, and it's just briefly talking about, and I, I'll just quickly do this. Um, so typically with supervised learning, you've got labeled data and you've got a machine learning algorithm and it generates a learned model. You give it data and you get a prediction. Um, and the different types of techniques, I've briefly talked about reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is learning based on feedback or reward, whereas unsupervised learning is just discovering patterns in unlabeled data. And this is just showing some of the problem types. So you get classification, you get regression, you get clustering, and then anomaly detection. And another one would be dimension reduction as well. And what was quite interesting here, well, this is just the, the basic toolboxes. So if you look at nearest neighbors, linear support vector machines, decision trees, and naive bays, on different problem sets you get um, really, here's nearest neighbor is the winning um, algorithm. Um, here, naive Bayes is the winning one. And here is linear SPM. Um, and now if you apply this deep learning, well, deep learning um, in a number of instances uh, is, 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 is obviously needs more data. But, but there's still a place for these kind of techniques um, as well. But uh, this is obviously some of the stock standard machine learning that's there. By the way, here is another thing, Shiraz is, uh, is currently live on YouTube, Generative Adversarial Neural Networks for Style Transfer. So he's doing style transfer and he's using gener Generative uh, Adversarial Neural Networks for that. That's another, this, this guy is just very, um, he's, he's very entertaining and he, he provides some really nice videos. So I would recommend uh, looking at him as well. Okay, this is just describing deep learning. I've given a definition, so I'll stop there. And, and maybe just quickly here, this is the human brain. So just to think about the path of what's happening in terms of instruction. So your eyes see something here, then it goes to the LGN uh, area, then the V1, V2, V4, which is obviously in the visual cortex, and then it gets to the temporal, inferior temporal cortex, and then from there, it actually goes to the frontal cortex. But what's but interesting here, um, on, in V1, it does the simple visual forms, the edges, the corners. If you look at V4, it does intermediate visual forms, feature and groups. And when it gets to the, the IT, the inferior temporal part, it's actually doing high level object descriptions, faces and objects. And this is exactly what the convolutional neural network um, is also doing. Um, so, and this is again showing some of the applications, so let me just... Um, I'm going to skip some of the stuff here. Um, this is again talking about deep learning, deep learning stuff, research players, startups in that area. All right, so here's some of the basics, and maybe just a few things here, and then we can go to Rikas. Um, the input data, typically if you look at a neural network, most people are applying this in data science. You've got input data, and then you need to do feature engineering. You need to create the, the inputs for that, for support vector machines or just your basic neural nets or naive or decision trees. You need to create, and there's a lot of time being spent on that, and then you apply your traditional machine learning. With deep learning, it actually helps to skip that part. And it, you take the data and you give it to the deep learning algorithm. But it sounds easy, but, but obviously it's still the way what's happening here, because it's not just the algorithm, it's the structures. It's, it's setting up, there's a lot of parameters as well, still. But it definitely saves time, you don't need to do that, uh, which, 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 is, which is great. Let me just get your, your out of the way. And this is what I wanted to show. So here's again a picture of the human brain. And you can see the V1, V2, V4, and IT areas. And this is an example of recognizing a cat. So a deep neural network consists of a hierarchy of layers where each layer transforms the input data. So it's transforming it, so this is like the transforms. And, and move the data to more abstract uh, representations, um, like an edge, a noise, a face. And then the output layer combines those features to make a prediction. So it typically uses convolutional neural nets, and I'll quickly show that, talk about that, but then in the end, it uses fully connected neural networks to do the prediction. Um, so here's an example of taking photos of 
human faces and you can see it's detecting edges so you've got it actually learns those feature detectors greatest feature maps the activation maps and then it works through that to start combining that into a nose and eye and then later on it's building these faces so the same kind of concepts are being utilized not only for, for vision but you can transform words and all sorts of things sound um, into into um, data as well okay so that's just uh, showing a deep a normal neural network input layer hidden layers output layers and it's going into the details here I think in the interest of time uh, I would love to actually show a bit more here but um, I what I want to do is maybe just on a high level is it's going into showing gradient descent and all of these kind of things I just maybe want to show you some of the, the main types of deep learning neural networks and, and, the, and the first one that I want to show is just auto encoders um, where it, you actually give it inputs um, and what you're trying to do is to, the output here is actually the input so what it's trying to do is to, uh, you, is to actually create a compressed feature vector that represents this image and the way it actually, I, how do you know this is good? because this is doing the encoding deep net network and then this part is doing the decoding and if it can decode and generate the output exactly as the input, then you know you've got, a, you've got something that works and you can trust. And now the cool things in, in the brain and, and in neural nets, the knowledge is stored in the weights. So you can actually take those weights and then plug them into another neural network that you've got really trained stuff um, that can generate, that can, um, that can recognize these features. Um, and this is some of the initial innovations uh, that Jeff Hinton started with in, I think, 2005. But, but again, so what's the application here is something like topic modeling. So a document in a, is a collection, uh, in a collection is converted to a bag of words and transformed to a compressed feature vector using autoencoder. The distance from every other document vector can be measured. So you've got a measure on that and then all nearby document vectors fall under the same topic and in that way you can have millions, millions of documents and you can start categorizing it and you can um, get to um, stuff that's similar and, and so forth okay so this is the convolutional neural network and I wish I, I wanted to actually go into a lot more detail here but um, uh, so yeah so I think <laughs> That's good. This is just an. I think I've talked quite a bit about this, so I'm just gonna. Um, this is just more examples of the same thing. Where, and, and, and by the way, there's some. There's two articles that I will also share. Uh, yeah, two two articles that, that that goes through a very intuitive definition of or description of how it works exactly, um, and I'll, I'll share that as well. Um, but anyway, so here is an example again, edges, you use the convolutional um, uh, networks to do the edges and the blobs and here the convolutional networks do textures, here it's actually doing object parts and then the, the, there's some fully connected ones and then it actually generates an object class um, for you. And then almost to finish here, recurring neural nets, um, you can have one signal and generating an output, one to many. You can have a sequence and then recognize something. Or you can have input signals, uh, like a, if you think about chat, you're talking, that's a sequence of words, and then you're waiting for a response, and then that could be the response. So you can use a recurrent neural network so that it does that. And you can see that um, it's passing on the previous states forward. So in that way, it's actually remembering what was what was said before um, and you can do it even many to many uh, there's so many different ways of doing it um, and one of the new innovations around recurrent neural networks and I've mentioned it briefly is uh, this is just an example of a neuron cell where you've got a forget gate well, first of all you've got the input coming in output going uh, out, and then the output there but inside here in this with the cell you've got a forget gate and this is, this is data coming from previous hidden units um, and it's so you can remember its previous state but you can actually put a gate there to control that 
and then you've got an input gate where you can say how important do I pay attention to the current one or do I actually pay attention more to my previous state and inputs. So that way you control that as well. And even the output, you can decide am I going to give an output right now or delay it or what, whatever. So you can control the output as well. So um, we're getting all better and better with these kind of things. This is an example of long, short-term memory, the current neural nets. And <laughs> this is interesting. So this is trained on structured Wikipedia markdown data. And it actually so it trains on this. There's so much data available, so you can start training this. And, 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 and this is an example of where you insert characters sequentially and predict the probabilities of the next letter. And so it's predicting what the next letter will be. And it's getting pretty accurate uh, with this. Um, so this is two examples. So this particular neuron, this is two different neurons, the results around that. This one is focused on just markdown. So this is, you can't really see at the back, but everything that's in markdown, uh, the green is excited state here. Um, and I think blue, what is that? I think blue is non-excited state. So this one is picking up um, URLs. That one is picking up markdowns. Um, yeah, green is excited, blue is not excited state. Um, so you can do things, interesting things like that. And this is what I mentioned, uh, the image captioning. It's combining a vision convolutional neural network and then using a recurrent language generating one. So it actually can generate different things. It won't necessarily generate the same thing. So it was saying a group of people shopping at an outdoor market, and here it's saying there are many vegetables at the fruit stand. Um, a close-up of a child holding a stuffed animal, and some of the examples I've already showed earlier on. But again, this is what it is, combination of deep learning neural networks. And then the other thing is just around, now you can take, what about words? We know we can take videos and photos or images and sounds and so, so, so forth, but you can actually create words. You can create a, a, embed, a word embedding where you actually put it in, 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 in a vector representation. So you can see in a purpose, uh, and a dolphin close to one another, sea world, um, camera, Paris there, but you can, you can actually, it learns these kind of things just based on documents that you, how, how the words are being just convey. There's a lot of information right there. So, um, and then these examples of women, man, areas here, all sorts of different things, putting cities together, um, putting France, Xbox, Reddish, all, all, all the different things. Or here's take, take and take, took. Um, man versus woman. So you can actually do calculations on this. Woman minus man is equal to aunt minus uncle. King minus male plus female is queen. Human minus animal is ethics. So the moment you've got vector representation embeddings, you can do all sorts of very interesting stuff. Um, okay, um, this is again the deep Q learning, and maybe I'll end with this one here. Um, it gets the pixels, and here is the joystick, and basically um, there's descriptions there, like just up, down, whatever, and it needs to figure that out. And obviously there's the reward signal coming through. But it's using convolutional neural networks, creating these high-level features, and then you've got to fully connect it to actually decide what direction, how should I move um, my, uh, or the thing like, is a, with a, the, the flappy bird, or my stick, or etc. Okay, um, I'm gonna, Rikus, I think, if you can come in, um, I wanted to do a, more demos and stuff. I've got actually maybe something that I, let me just, just on a second, I just wanna show you, while you set up, let me just um, show this. Um, By the way, this is TensorFlow on TensorBoard, so you can you can so if you just want to play around uh, with neural networks, um, this is this is something that we absolutely recommend just playing if you're new to this. Um, but I wanted to show you is just the um, I've got actually an interesting example. I think it's this one. Very nice visualization of a convolutional neural network. Um,
Do you have internet? Uh, yeah. Articles, uh, intuitive explanation of convolutional neural networks, and he's actually showing the examples towards the latter part. Um, yeah, this one. Playing around with this. Maybe he's site where well, he's coming. Uh, is it, it's coming. Anyway, um, you can play with this afterwards, but it's, 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 it's actually showing a full convolution neural network, and you can draw figures, handwritten stuff, and it shows the whole visualization. Every, you can see every node, you can zoom in on every node, um, etc. But uh, I think uh, let's stop there. Are you ready? Okay, great. So let's. Uh, I, oh, sorry. Yeah. I just want to say. I, <laughs> Because it's, uh, I, I wanted to, um, I've got Python notebooks open there um, on, 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 on some of the things that I wanted to take you through, but I will share those links. I've got it actually nicely summarized, so you can, in your own time, go through it. And I will um, also, if there's any questions, we can, we can obviously talk about that. The community is there to interact about it, but uh, great. So, Rikus, over to you. Great. Hello, everybody. Um, is that good? Everybody can hear? Yes. No. Not? Oh, it was, it was really on. Oh. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, good. Right. Um, so, IBM Interconnect 2017. Uh, IBM uh, Interconnect is IBM's big conference in primarily at IBM internally and their business partners. IBM's got about 360,000 employees, so it's quite an issue to just keep everybody up with what's going on inside. Um, so, my name is Rikas Combrink and I work for OLSPS Analytics, and they are IBM business partner. Uh, so, that was in that capacity that I was there. Um, I thought it was interesting to share this because it, it, in one, on one hand it's just IBM's vision but on the other hand what they're doing is, is right at the bleeding edge and it does trickle through to the rest of industry. So in some way it eventually touches you if you're in this field in, in, in one way or another. Um, I'm, although I work for uh, well, SPS Analytics, I'm doing this in personal capacity, so my opinions here are on my own and not that of my company or, or IBM. <laughs> <laughs> conference <Yeah. was laughs> conference was uh, over four and a half days, 2,200 sessions, and 25,000 people. It's, it's huge. Um, just some pictures to get an idea. It's a Mandalay Bay Hotel in, in Las Vegas. Uh, it's really an excellent venue. Um, there are people eating. <laughs> they try to stick 25,000 people <laughs> in something that looks like an aircraft hangar. It serves them breakfast and lunch every day. Uh, it's just unbelievable how smooth everything runs. Now, when I was there, I focused, I went primarily for um, IBM's Cloud Vision and for Watson. Uh, they were also talking a lot about IoT and blockchain and security. I pretty much ignored that. There's just no time to get everything. Um, today, I want to tell you about these things. IBM's vision, um, their cloud platform as it is at the moment, um, and some personal takeaways, my, my own uh, insights um, and what I found there. So this first, uh, Jenny Romaki is the CEO, and she had a keynote speech. And I'm going to tell you what she was saying. Uh, so not necessarily what I think about it, but just um, the main ideas that she was trying to bring across. There's 
inside Medley Bay Hotel, they put a stadium that can handle 12,000 people. That thing was packed. You, bet, you probably can't see it. I moved for hands in front of you. Right, so she was talking, um, she, the keynote she devoted almost entirely to IBM's cloud vision. And she, she had three main points there. She said IBM Cloud is enterprise strong, and it's data first, and it's cognitive to the core. Nice integration. <laughs> what does she mean with enterprise strong? There were these points. Um, they operate at scale. 50 data centers in 19 countries, they're all over the place. Largest commercial IoT platform. It's a public cloud, but they make a big deal about the fact that it's specifically designed for industry. They're targeting large companies. Um, data sovereignty is very important to them. And, and um, they become giving you choice in the sense that you can decide whether you want your data and your applications on premise or move it to the cloud. You can choose level of privacy um, and you can choose from a wide range of services. They actively support um, and embrace hybrid solutions in the sense that you can't just move to the cloud um, in one day. It's a process. And the way to deal with that is to have a bit of both. Um, both on the data layer and uh, application layer. Make, make a big deal about security. Um, and they have a comprehensive innovation roadmap. They spoke about uh, blockchain a lot. They have their own blockchain uh, implementation and they're going, uh, getting into quantum computing, and the idea is that all these services eventually uh, become a part of the cloud offering. Idea with data first is, whereas somebody like Facebook and Google makes a big deal about democratization of data, IBM says, um, no, your data is your data, and we're doing everything to help you to protect that. Um, they are aware of governance issues, so legal issues about uh, whose data you have and where it may be at any time. Fine grained access control, you can choose whether it's public or private, or whether you want to license specific parts of it to specific people. Uh, you can choose the locality because they have data centers all over the world. You can choose where you want your data to be. And they've just recently, I think in April, opened a local data center in Johannesburg. So you can now you can have your own data here in the country. Uh, and isolation in terms of you can choose which data, well, which data center, but inside the data center, uh, you can, if you demand it, have it on your own servers. Um, and even on servers, um, it can be isolated with virtual machines. So then there's different levels of making sure that nobody can really touch your data. Cognitive to the core, that's about Watson cognitive um, computing. Um, Largely, boils, uh, it's, it's computing with unstructured data. At the moment, it largely boils down to natural language processing. Uh, but you do handle a range of data types of writing, uh, text in its voice, and, and lots of uh, IoT sensors. A range of capabilities, ways of dealing with their data, um, standard predictive analytics, um, and now increasingly machine learning and then cognitive computing, which again is, is Watson, nat natural language processing most. Part of Watson is um, are, are a number of, of pre-packaged cur curated knowledge domains that they're building with various partners. So if they do, say, a uh, uh, healthcare application, all that knowledge is gathered and um, it's not just automatically put together, there's an enormous amount of human effort that goes into building those databases uh, at this time. And the idea is with time it will become more automated, but there will be this huge database of, of high quality data. Now, so, so that was Ginny Romaine, that, that was her speech. Um, more generally, if we zoom out a bit, uh, I'd be interested in strategic overview, and there are three main points there. And it's a platform, tool that you can use. Um, there's a specific ecosystem which really boils down to the companies they work with. And then they have a, a methodology that they're trying to push through data, um, uh, through business partners to industry in general. The platform, um, so what's a data platform is, is not a specific piece of software. That, that's a concept really. But within data, what's a data platform, there are four specific pieces of software, if you will, if you will, uh, cloud implementations. 
God will make, and, and they made a big deal about catering for four different roles. Data engineers, business analysts, data science, and app developers. And these specific platforms are aimed at, at those roles. So Data Connect is about connecting a large variety of data sources, um, any database you can think of, your own files in whatever format. And all of this is thrown in a data lake um, where you can access and mix and match from, from all those sources. What's in analytics? Uh, that, as far as I'm concerned, at this time is a bit of a joke. It's a, it's a very simple sort of business intelligence tool. You, you dump in a relational database or a spreadsheet, and you can find simple correlations and draw graphs. It's not really very useful at this time. Data science experience is the major offering at this time. And that's a platform uh, that they used to bring together a large number of open source data science um, software packages.